Welcome to The Breakdown. This is Yasser Louati speaking to you straight from the Paris South Side banlieue. Today, I will be speaking about a hotly contested topic, Palestine and the recent waves of normalizations or officialization of um, connections between various Arab countries. And myself, being of African descent, I will be talking about the recent announcement of the Kingdom of Morocco to normalize its relations, if not officialize them, with the occupying entity called Israel. And for this show, not being Palestinian myself, I brought uh, a brilliant woman that I have discovered recently, uh, Lara El Borno, who happens to be Palestinian American, American Palestinian, it depends, you know, in what sense she prefers to use it, turned uh, American Palestinian French Parisian, if I can say, and she's going to speak with us about how she views the events, speak to us about her vision of, you know, the current events as a Palestinian woman who's been living these events intimately, and of course, to kind of give us a, uh, a um, a deeper analysis between the differences in regards to relationship with Palestine when it comes to uh, Arabs in America and Arabs in France. Lara El Borno, welcome to The Breakdown. Thank you so much for having me, Asim. Well, it's an honor and a personal uh, pleasure for me to have you on the show. We spoke about it, you know, in the past. Uh, I won't introduce you because your story is actually one of a kind. So please tell us who is Lara El Borno and what brought a girl from Chicago to Paris? Yeah, well, I am, as you said, a lawyer. I am Palestinian. My parents are actually from Gaza. Um, I have never been to Gaza, but um, I was born in Kuwait, like many Palestinian refugees who ended up in the Gulf. And I eventually grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. Um, when my family went to the U.S. following the Gulf War and the invasion of Kuwait. Um, I studied law in Chicago, um, and after getting qualified in the United States, I decided to come to Paris to become even more specialized in international law. So I studied European law at SS, and then eventually I started working in Paris, and now it's been eight years that I've been here. So... You came here for studies or it was first a personal choice to come to Paris and then continue your, your studies? No, it was definitely a continuation of my studies. I had already finished my law degree, my JD in America, um, and I really just wanted to expand my horizons and my specialization a little bit more. And having already studied um, the French language in college, I uh, thought I would put it to use by coming to Paris and seeing if I could break into the Paris legal scene. Which you did, and congratulations. Which I did, and here we are eight years later. Well, honestly, I couldn't be more proud of you, to be, to say the least. And uh, uh, we cross paths, you know, giving our respective, you know, lookalike works, even though you are a lot more knowledgeable when it comes to law than me. Uh, and I brought you here to kind of speak as a Palestinian woman who has both perspectives as a Palestinian woman in America and in France, and of course the relationships you can have in North America and in Europe. Uh, what ticked me when uh, Morocco announced uh, its uh, officialization of you know, relations with, uh, with the state of Israel is a four-letter word, yawn. Please tell us why you wrote that as a reaction to, the, uh, to uh, especially to Morocco's decision to officialize its relations with, you know, with the, the Zionist entity. And I will tell you why, it, to me, it was like it took me off guard. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, this whole idea with normalizing relations with Israel, um, it's definitely not new. So, the, you know, it's already been 26 years since the last normalization uh, between an Arab state and Israel, which was uh, in that case, Jordan. And before that, there was Egypt. Um, and then in the last few months, we've really seen just like this acceleration of normalization deals, um, beginning with the United Arab Emirates, and then of course, Bahrain and Sudan, and now of course, Morocco. And so I think as, uh, as a Palestinian, um, this is in no sense surprising. Um, we uh, know very well that many of these countries have maintained informal, somewhat secret relations with Israel over the years. Um, they've cooperated together on security matters. 
um, and uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and so by now, um, uh, at this point, we're just expecting more normalization. Um, and we have to remember that Trump was very clear from the beginning of his presidency, he had said that this was going to be a priority for him. He's been talking about it for years now. Um, and so it's really no surprise that these countries, which in and of themselves do not represent their own people, have now taken these steps, which are wildly unpopular amongst their people, wildly unpopular amongst the local populations, but which have a benefit to themselves, whether economic, whether uh, political, whether strategic, and we can talk about those in more detail. Well, actually, you're definitely right because we see what those decisions being taken. Actually, these normalizations, they highlight the nature of Arab regimes, which means they are undemocratic and you have a you know, handful, of, you know, handful of people deciding for the fate you know, of millions of others. And, in the case of Morocco, I mean, first, the reason why I ticked on that reaction of yours, which was uh, yawn, is because it hits differently for us of African descent when it happens that, you know, from our countries from back home. You know, of course, we grew up, we got, you know, we, you know, we became adults and, you know, Egypt had normalized, Jordan had normalized. I myself lived in Jordan for quite some time when I was, you know, based as a pilot over there. And I could see that yeah, well, it's a taboo. Like, of course, they, they wouldn't dare criticizing the authorities, but when you speak to, to, to everyday citizens, then, you know, we are against the, this normalization of these like, you know, uh, occupying forces. And, as, and, and you're definitely right that they definitely shed light on how these regimes operate, especially in the case of Morocco. It's a monarchy. Uh, foreign policy is literally the absolute monopoly of the king. And to make things look even shadier in the case of Morocco, and you again, you hit it on the nail by saying it's not about peace, it's about crony capitalism. And on that, I think I have to salute you because it, you know, it turned out that the next day, the New York Times published a piece uh, informing us that the, the deal you know, was you recognize, you normalize relations with Israel, and in return, you get a $3 billion investment. And those investments, will be made in companies owned by the king and his immediate you know, uh, close relations. But there's another decision, as you said, you know, a, a strategic one. It was to acknowledge or recognize Morocco's sovereignty over the Western Sahara. And to quote a Western Saharan woman based in Northern Europe, she said, well, they are just uh, legitimizing one occupation with another. And in a conversation last night at the CJL, we had this debate and it became clear to us that today we no longer have Palestine alone. It's going to be Palestine and the Western Sahara. And these two questions will have to be dealt with as absolute priorities because the Western Sahara for so long has been a taboo, especially among Moroccans. And the Western Sahara was actually part of Moroccan identity. And that's why many Moroccans get hysterical about it. Having said that, uh, the accords were named, are, are being named the Abraham Accords, and we see the UAE, you know, being, you know, the locomotive of these normalization uh, you know, initiatives. What makes, what do you think of the term Abraham Accords, on the one hand, when it began with, you know, uh, Bahrain normalizing, etc., and when you see that Palestine has been sold out, I say, for cheap, and it has been sold out to legitimize the occupation of the Western Sahara. So two questions in one, the Abraham Accords term and what it means for you to see one occupation being legitimized by another. Yeah, so just to clarify, the Abraham Accords refers to the collection of agreements that were signed by the United States with the United um, Arab Emirates and Israel, but then also uh, the, it includes as well the, uh, the um, uh, agreements that were signed between Israel and um, Bahrain. And you know, I think the framing is very intentional um, by calling them the Abraham Accords. We're setting the stage for being able to um, represent this as a religious conflict as an ancient conflict, which goes back all the way to the time of uh, our beloved prophet Abraham, peace be upon him, and that somehow magically it's only today that this conflict 
has been resolved and all thanks to President Trump for orchestrating all of this. Now, of course, the reality is not at all um, uh, equivalent to this discourse which is being propagated. Um, in fact, none of these countries have been um, at war with Israel. There is no religious conflict between Bahrain and the UAE and Morocco um, and Sudan and Israel on religious, uh, you know, matters. They're not arguing about anything, uh, you know, uh, spiritual or theological. There's no debate about these issues. So why frame these agreements as sort of religious uh, conflict resolution agreements? And that is simply to hide the reality of the situation. The reality of the situation is that there is a conflict here, but it's not with these states in Israel. It is with the Palestinians. It is with Palestine and Israel. And what is the nature of this conflict? This conflict, if I borrow the words of the American University professor Rashid Khalidi, he speaks about um, the struggle of a colonized people against a colonizing state that is stealing resources, stealing land without giving any of those people who are on this land um, any rights. And so um, it's a settler colonial state. Israel engages in the transfer of its population to Palestinian land in violation of international law. This is um, outlined by the fourth Geneva Conventions and numerous Security Council resolutions, but Israel continues to do it. There's now over 700,000 settlers in the occupied Palestinian West Bank, which has been occupied now for over 50 years. Occupation under international law is supposed to be a temporary status. I think we can all agree that an, an, a 50 year long occupation is not a temporary status. And so the question becomes, well, what about these people and why don't they have rights? The millions of Palestinians who live on this land, who have now seen their land reduced to tiny little Bantu stands while the colonies continue to grow and grow, and while Israeli law is applied to the colonies and the Jewish Israelis that live on Palestinian land, while at the same time, military law applies to the Palestinians. So this is a situation of apartheid. Noam Chomsky has referred to it as worse than apartheid. This is the situation that we are dealing with on the ground. And this is the situation that we're not talking about at the expense of pretending that we have made peace in a religious conflict between some countries that were never even at war. When you see this series of shameful episodes again for the Arab world, when you have again illegitimate, at least on the, on the popular side, illegitimate you know, rulers deciding because their immediate private specific interests lie with the interests of the occupation of Palestine, when you see that this has been accelerating. I'm not Palestinian. But I grew up in a household where Palestine was central. It was as a child and people always ask me, where do you trace back your activism? To me, it's the first intifada because yeah. I was uh, living in Tunisia and we saw the first intifada on an Arab television, which means no censorship. So as a child, this kind of, you are discovering the horror of this world. And to me, there is no minimizing it or trying to, but again, it will never hit me as much as it would, it would hit, you know, a Palestinian person like yourself. I'm not gonna speak of the previous wave of, you know, normalization, but I'm, talk, I'm going to talk about this one. How does it feel beyond, of course, the sarcastic yawn, I'm not surprised, these people are illegitimate, the people are angry. How does it feel, you know, just witnessing it and you're like, how do you, know, do you ask yourself, is it going to get any worse? How do, you, how do you live it as a person? Well, you know, I think it's really important to keep in mind that the Palestinian people have been struggling for their rights and just for their mere existence um, for some 100 years now. I mean, this really goes back to the fall of the Ottoman Empire, the beginning of British colonialism in Palestine, the British Mandate of Palestine, and eventually the creation of the State of Israel on a land where 800,000 Palestinians were expelled from their land in what constituted the Nakba. I mean, this is really the source of this conflict. When I think about this, um, you know, it's difficult for me because we 
have always been resisting and we will always continue to resist. We have never relied on anyone else to, um, to vindicate or to support us in, in our struggle because Palestinians on the ground are doing it. They're living it every day. Even as a Palestinian um, in the diaspora, you know, just me even saying I'm Palestinian. When I was in the US, even just the fact to say I'm a Palestinian American, you know, people will say, oh, we don't want to talk about politics. And it's like, it's not political, it's just who I am. Um, that I would often hear that as a response. Um, so I think, yes, I'm disappointed. We are disappointed, but we also didn't have any false hope in these regimes and we have not. Um, and we've been organizing ourselves um, as a people also in the face of pretty incompetent leadership. Um, and, and, and really the struggle is with the people and it's always been, and it always will be. How would you analyze the failures of the Palestinian leadership? Not only the official one under Mahmoud Abbas, but all the leaders of the, you know, Palestinian, what can I say, apparatus, if I can say, yeah. between divisions, rivalries, and the results of today. You know, how do you, what's your, your view on that? How are you critical on how it's being, you know, dealt with the multiple reconciliations and split again? How do you, given what's happening today? I mean, I think there's a lot that can be said about this issue. There's no doubt that we need to be united and that we need to have a united voice because if we're divided, it's, you know, the most classic situation in all of you know political science is divide and conquer if palestinians are divided it's going to be easier for us to remain in this situation and it's going to be more difficult for us to assert our rights um, so obviously there needs to be um, a united front um, in, in you know on the international stage um, there also needs to be new leadership um, there needs to be leadership that really represents the grassroots because, you know, for example, the Palestinian grassroots has been organizing for years now on this subject of BDS and has been calling for the boycott um, of Israel um, uh, as inspired by the, the boycotts that took place during apartheid South Africa. And so this is a form of nonviolent resistance, which Palestinian civil society has put an open call to the world to join um, the, the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement um, in order to try to create some change on the ground for Palestinian rights. The Palestinian leadership has not um, endorsed BDS, for example. That's something that um, they should consider because this is where the people's um, resistance, um, uh, this is one of the forms of the people's resistance. So there needs to be um, uh, less of a discrepancy between the people um, and again, the leadership. And I mean, we can talk about the specific failures of the Palestinian Authority. And honestly, it's, it's a subject all on its own because yeah. um, at some point over the summer, the Palestinian Authority said they were gonna stop their security cooperation with Israel. And then eventually they restarted because now um, Joe Biden is set to take office and apparently he was involved um, in, 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 in reinstating this, you know, this uh, cooperation between them. Um, I think that the old, um, the old framework, the Oslo framework, um, this whole let's stay stuck in peace talks for years and years and years while the settlements continue to be built, while nothing changes on the ground, while Gaza is still under blockade. Gaza is still under a blockade which has deprived it from over $16 billion in funds, in commerce, since the beginning of this blockade, this blockade is intentionally subjecting these people to collective punishment. This is something which has been noted by you know, human rights organizations. Um, the United Nations came out with a report verifying this figure of $16 billion, and yet Israel still subjects Gaza to this blockade. Why? There's no reason for it. It's collective punishment under international law. It's illegal. There are concrete things that the Palestinian leadership could be doing to um, call for an end to, uh, you know, to, 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 to these things like the blockade in Gaza, but they're not doing it. Um, and, uh, and I think it's a subject all on its own, but there, there's certainly a failure in leadership um, that, uh, that needs to be addressed. But like I said, the grassroots have always been where the heart of the struggle is, and that's where it will, it will remain. Well, uh, you know, it's like you mentioned the uh, the fate of Gaza, you know, still being under a brutal blockade, one of the most inhumane around the world. It's literally at you know a jail cell with you know in, in open sky, but 
this again highlights the conditions in, uh, in which this, uh, this normalization drive is happening. Israel made no concession, absolutely none. So what, make, what would make someone sane come later in down the line and say, we will ask Israel to compromise? I mean, I can, without compromising anything under a far right government, they obtained all these normalizations from you know, the UAE, Bahrain, Sudan, and, and now Morocco, you know, and that's basically, you know, ends the peace process based on compromise between, uh, between both sides. So how do you think, I mean, like, of course, this is, I'm just asking, how do you see things evolving when Israel was given of almost, not yet given a free ride, all these normalizations, and, and they had nothing to do about it, as you know, in yeah. terms of concession. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really important point. The idea that, you know, these agreements are being framed as some sort of peace agreements that will secure some concessions for Palestinians. These agreements have secured absolutely no concessions whatsoever and have not improved the lives of Palestinians in any way. So let's be very clear about that. When the uh, agreements with the United Arab Emirates and Israel was announced, um, one of the uh, Emirati ministers went on CNN and she spoke about how the Palestinian question would remain um, front and center and that, you know, uh, the, the Emirates uh, supports the right to a dignified life for Palestinians. Well, it didn't take but a few weeks before it was announced that part of the investments that are going to take place in um, Israel are going to be investments by the Emirates to upgrade and modernize the entire checkpoint regime in the West Bank. So let's be very clear about that. $3 billion of investments as part of a, a fund, which is called the Abraham Fund, part of that fund is going to be used to modernize the checkpoints that are in the occupied West Bank. Okay, so now the Emiratis are actually physically contributing to the physical structures of the occupation. And for your listeners, if they're not aware, Israel operates a system of 700 checkpoints in the occupied Palestinian West Bank that prevent Palestinians from moving in their own land. And why do these checkpoints exist? They exist to protect the now 700,000 uh, 700, illegal uh, Jewish settlers that are on Palestinian land in contravention with international law. So basically, um, this idea that the Emirates, um, you know, signing this agreement with Israel is somehow going to accord Palestinians rights is not only false, but actually the opposite is happening. They are now participating. They are now participating very clearly um, in the in the occupation. What do you send as a message to the people being ruled by those people who are normalizing with Israel? I know the governments, they don't, we know, we know they don't listen. Uh, I happen to have been lucky enough to live in, you know, five countries in the Middle East. But again, the fear is that this idea becomes normal for the next generations and that in and of itself, why fight Israel, the Israeli occupation? That has always been like this way. What do we send as a message to the broader part? I'm not talking about the Arab world. I'm talking about this, the people in those countries, because they're not always Arabs. They're not always Muslims. They are people being ruled by despotic regimes who don't see any problem with doing what they're doing. So if you were to speak to Moroccans, Sudanese, Bahrainis, Emiratis, probably Saudis, you know, with the way things are going, what do we send as a message? I mean, first and foremost, I would tell them that um, that we know Palestinians know that they don't support this. I mean, in large part, the majority of these people uh, don't support the decisions that have been taken to normalize relations with Israel. Um, I would also um, tell them that there is an opportunity now to um, actually really participate in the nonviolent resistance um, that um, in the form of boycott, because now as a result of this normalization, what you're going to see is you're going to see um, the markets in you know, Morocco and the UAE and Bahrain and so on and so forth be flooded with Israeli products. It's now their opportunity to participate in the boycott of Israeli products to say that, no, we're not going to um, purchase products from a, an apartheid regime. And here I'm quoting the former president, Jimmy Carter, who says this. Um, 
uh, has called Israel an apartheid regime, or Noam Chomsky, who said it's worse than apartheid. On your point that, you know, why should we care? It's always been like this. I'm a firm believer that injustice is not a sustainable um, state of affairs, okay? Especially colonialism especially colonialism, because even if it takes 130 years, like it did in the case of Algeria, it, it always comes to an end. It's, it's a state of affairs which is so profoundly unjust that it is simply not sustainable. And so eventually a day will come when Israel will have to make a choice. It will either have to integrate all of the Palestinians that live in the West Bank and Gaza as a part of its population and accord them equal rights, or it will have to finally dismantle the checkpoints, dismantle the colonies, and allow for the creation of the two-state solution, which is the uh, solution which has been supported under um, uh, by the international community um, for the last few decades. But this whole idea of there being now a greater Israel with Palestinians subject to Bantu stands in the West Bank or uh, living in the world's largest open air prison in Gaza, this state of affairs, which we have today, is completely unsustainable. So I encourage people to be hopeful as well, um, because we know that, um, you know, just based on historical precedent, um, colonizers have always lost. Um, they, don't, they don't ever maintain their regimes indefinitely. Well, actually, speaking of hope, you know, there was a decision taken by the European Court of uh, Human Rights, or, yeah, of Human Rights, the ECHR, that actually uh, went after France and condemned France for criminalizing uh, BDS uh, in France. There was a collective, you know, 11 activists of the BDS movement in France that they were tried, and the, EC, the European Court of Human Rights actually you know, deemed their prosecution completely illegal. But now France is still trying to bypass this court ruling because we have had a minister circular, uh, um, uh, circular ministerial, I, I forgot who it was under, Michel Aliomari under Nicolas Sarkozy that actually you know, deemed illegal the boycott of Israel. Now, in France, the situation is extremely complex when it comes to supporting uh, the Palestinian struggle. And it's actually worse than in the US, you know, if we take a look at how public opinion is evolving in the US on the question of Palestine and how things are getting worse in France. First, we have, of course, the hegemony of the far-right organization called the CRIF that poses as the absolute representative of Jewish organizations and French Jewish communities. And uh, this organization called Le CRIF, which poses as France's APAC, that you know, you, you know pretty well in the US, has been lobbying for so many years to the point of intimidating policymakers in order to oblige France to follow the, to protect the interests of, of not Israel, but Zionism and the ideology per se. And that's why the court ruling that happened, you know, just you know, a few days ago means that even the European Court of Human Rights acknowledges that boycotting Israel is completely legal. Now, of course, there is the criminalization of the idea. They may not win in court, but because a minister of interior, Michel Aliomari, some years ago issued this declaration, it is still used as a legal document to kind of prohibit BDS uh, collectives around France. And that it is true that we have also been, I'm going to say, impressed by the successes of BDS. And the fact that in France it is criminalized is no surprise. And now I'm going to move to a slightly parallel question is, the criminalization of BDS came through the efforts of the CRIF in France, mm -hmm. which has been making sure that the question of Palestine is completely delegitimized and that policymakers in France openly you know, stand with Israel. Even yeah. when it's bombing, you know, Gaza or any other, you know, uh, um, area of, you know, occupied Palestine, we have seen people like François Hollande supporting that and refusing to condemn it. We have seen, you know, staunch Zionists from the left and the right, for whatever reason, it makes them believe that, you know, Zionism will serve their interests. We have seen those people being outspoken. Now, but that's not the only, how can I say, front of the creep in France. There is also the front of Islamophobia in the way that the, the same people who promote vigorously 
Israel's right for annexation to be above the law and that Israel is above any account, sort of accountability, even harassing policymakers. I mean, I have seen how, uh, for example, the American Jewish Committee and their counterpart in Europe called, AJ, yeah, it's a AJC Europe. And the way they literally bully you know, diplomats and policymakers in the European Union. And I dealt with them, for example, in the, you know, at the uh, European Commission in Brussels. And you would definitely see how they operate. It's literally about intimidation. Now, having said that, do you think it, I'm gonna take you back a little bit into some history. The Palestinian question itself has also divided the grassroots in France. For organizations of the, uh, descendants of you know, the colonies, uh, especially from North Africa, there was a schism in the 1960s and 70s, right? As we are struggling for our rights against police brutality, racism, and you know, uh, various you know, types of discriminations as working class people from the colonies, where do we stand on the Palestinian issue? And many thought that there, there needs to be a separation between the interests of the Arabs who work and live in France and Palestine. And that schism, that line of separation still exists today. People think that because speaking of Palestine would add more challenges to the question of Islamophobia, racism, police brutality, that you know, Palestine should not be mentioned and that Palestine should be left for those dealing with it. How do you react when you see people privately supporting Palestine as activists but in their daily activities, whether they are fighting against police brutality, against Islamophobia, against anti-Black racism, et cetera, when you bring in the, the question of Palestine, they don't see the connection between the occupation of Palestine and their struggles in France. Of course, it's easy for anyone to say, well, you know, you know Israel has been training police officers, but nevertheless, they will tell you, you know what, if you speak about Palestine, you're just making things worse. What's your, your reaction to that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there, there have been so many efforts um, over the years to censor Palestinian activists, to completely um, make it taboo to speak about Palestine, even if you're just using the language of international law. Um, which, you know, how can, how can that be taboo? Like, this is what we have all agreed on as a consensus, as an international community. This is, this is you know, whether it's customary international law or other regimes of international law. I mean, you cannot make taboo something of this nature. So I think, you know, this attempt to separate all of us and separate struggles um, and to censor certain struggles, these are common tactics. And, um, uh, that are used by oppressors. Um, for me, it's clear that all these um, struggles are connected with one another and activists have been making these connections um, globally for, for decades. This is nothing new to connect the struggles with one another. Um, uh, for example, if, I, if, if, if you're speaking to somebody who says that, okay, I'm gonna be an Islamophobia activist in France, but I'm not gonna speak about Palestine, well, it's very clear that the Israeli right wing engages in a language of Islamophobia to justify its occupation uh, of Palestine, to justify its siege on Gaza, to justify the actions that it takes. It regularly refers to Palestinians as terrorists, um, and it plays on these sort of Islamophobic stereotypes to try to, again, shield or hide or um, you know, sort of distract from the reality of the situation. So um, I think that you know the connection, the issues are definitely connected. I mean, especially when you look at, for example, in the United States, um, with the global civil rights movement that we saw this summer that that um, was born out of the murder of George Floyd um, um, earlier this year. Um, there was again a reawakening of the Black Palestinian Solidarity Movement, which um, was, uh, you know, born again in 2014 following the murder of um, um, Mike Brown. Mike Brown, and now again we're seeing the connections being made, um, you know, again and again between um, the oppression of Black people in the United States and the militarization 
um, of the state of Israel and the oppression of Palestinians in the West Bank. Again, the histories are completely different and the scope of, 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 of the oppression is also different, but there are clear connections um, that exist between the oppressors, the United States and Israel in this case. Um, and we should be aware of those things and we should extend our solidarity to all um, uh, all oppressed peoples across the world. I mean, I think for me, this is obvious. I, have, I obviously can't tell anybody how to, um, you know, do their activism because people have to do what works for them and what they feel, um, you know, they're willing to, um, you know, deal with because, you know, these, they will try to silence you. If you do have something, you know, of value to say and of principle to say, there's always somebody whose interest it is to silence you. So it's, it's a tough issue, but personally, I, I feel it's beneficial to connect these struggles and to form alliances across all oppressed peoples globally. Especially that, and, and, and this time I'm speaking as an activist who's been on these issues for years, is that this supposedly strategic choice of disconnecting our struggles in the banlieue uh, from Palestine because it would be too problematic and it would be up against you know, bigger foes has clearly failed because we see the oh, anywhere you see Islamophobia, both in the US, France, the UK, pro-Israelis are never far. Yeah. For example, you know, I, I, we, we, um, at the CJL, the Justice and Liberties for Our Committee that, that I happen to, uh, to work, to, 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 uh, to, uh, to head or preside, whatever you, uh, you know, if it's best, is we made the connecting points and every single time we will take a look, for example, at uh, Natasha Polony, who is like a staunch, you know, right wing, you know, so, you know pro-French sovereignty ideologue. And it turns out that her web channel is financed by the same pro-Israeli who's financing another web channel by another Zionist. And having remained quiet on these connections did not protect the proponents of this strategy. Of course, it's not the time to speak about that because you know there's a lot of repression going on here in France today as we speak. But having the and and I told many people, I was like, hold on a second. So you're so you want to call out some Islamophobes, but not others. You're not making any sense. They are all working together. They may disagree on some issues, but they are definitely banding against you. Why would you remain quiet on this one and not the other one? Uh, and I'm going to give you, for example, why it works this way. And this is an example that I, uh, that I personally encountered. Uh, there is this, you know, uh, journalist in France. I don't want to name because I don't want to get sued for libel, and you know, uh, but you know, he knows who he is, and if he finds this video, he will know I'm talking about him. You know, who poses as this friend of Muslims? He wrote a book about uh, our dear poor Muslim that nobody likes. Uh, people now we know who I'm talking about, and several times I would see him on television trying to bring give a platform to some Muslims. Okay, we're like, okay, why not? Okay, he was like, yeah, I changed my mind. Islamophobia is evil and this is wrong. What we're doing, you know, Muslims are our neighbors, etc. And I dealt with him personally because one day I, sh I shared uh, Shlomo Sand's uh, article called Islamophobia as has replaced anti Semitism in France. And Shlomo Sand is a, you know, a staunch you know, critic of you know, Israel, you know, uh, you know yeah. fluent in French, etc. And he explains how these ideologues, Bernard Henri Lévy, um, Alain F Finkielkraut, and all of these supposedly pro Israel that never live in Israel, but they're constantly uh, you know, defending it. He said, like, these people are feeding Islamophobia. And today, anti Semitism may be perceived as evil because it is politically dangerous to legitimize it in France, at least officially. But Islamophobia now is what, Islam what anti Semitism was. Um, in the 1930s and 40s in France. And I just shared them like, because well, I think it was quick. And the guy calls and literally like, you know, starts like, you know, <laughs> I mean, the conversation did not go well to say the yeah. name. And what I had found out is that he had these relations with all, you know, the other activists he had dealt with, but he did not know me. We, we, we met once or twice and he thought he, he could have this, you know, condescending like, relationship telling you what could be said and like, you know, upset that I would compare anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Well, like, listen, historically they have their, you know, they, their different dynamics, but nevertheless, 
Islamophobia is the acceptable form of racism that gets your promotion on the political ladder, the same way anti-Semitism allowed the promotion of some intellectuals. Well, after the conversation, it turned out because I made a few calls that he does what many pro-Israelis do even in the US is that we will support you against Islamophobia, but you remain on the condition you don't say a word on Israel. And unfortunately, people have come across, you know, in the activism, you know, you know, Nebula, they have accepted this deal. As long as I'm given a platform by this dude or this other person, okay, then I'm getting something out of it. But at the end of the day, all of them get burnt. And this is a word that I said for this podcast is that don't buy into this. If you stand against Islamophobia, against any form of oppression, you definitely stand against the occupation of Palestine. And this is something that I went through myself and, I, and it was, let's say some years ago when I wasn't very knowledgeable on how these things work. It was shocking for me that he would openly say it. You know, uh, I'm gonna have two more questions, but the, the, the first one being, you're a lawyer, you specialize in international law and you spoke about international law. I'm going to be provocative, you have to forgive me, uh, Lara. <laughs> 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 what weight does international law have in these conditions when an illegal occupation goes on for decades, when a blockade goes on for decades, when the people calling it, calling it out are treated as rogue states at the macro level and are criminalized at the individual level? When does international law play, how can I say, its role to bring about justice? Well, I, you know, in, in responding to this, I'm inspired by the Palestinian uh, lawyer and, and legal scholar Noura Arakat, who uh, wrote a book called Justice for Some, Law and the Question of Palestine. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea is, is that international law is only as good as the political will that there is to enforce it. If I were to summarize um, basically the um, uh, the the idea in her book, it can be used, it's a tool, but it's always used with some sort of a strategic aim. And if you completely ignore it, that can happen. If, if there's no political will to enforce it, that can happen. But it can also be something that can be used as a tool to um, actually affirm people's rights. So I think what you what you've highlighted is 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 very it's very important. It's that there is a body of international law that supports Palestinian rights. The problem is, however, it hasn't really been enforced. Um, now that being said, there is also um, numerous situations where some resolution would have been passed if it were not, for example, for the interference uh, by the United States by casting the sole veto so that no um, uh, resolution is passed condemning Israel for its violation of international law. But even having said that, disregarding all the instances where the US has exercised its veto power, there, is still, there are still numerous resolutions on the books, whether they come from the General Assembly or the Security Council that call out Israel for its violations of international law and affirm some scope of Palestinian rights. Um, and the, the question, however, is whether or not there's a political will to enforce these um, resolutions or to enforce international law in general. Um, and so far, what we have seen is that there just has not been. And, and the reason for that is because of the very critical US role in maintaining the status quo. Um, the, US role, uh, the US role in supporting Israel cannot be understated. The US gives Israel $3 billion each year in military um, and economic aid. During the Obama administration, Obama actually approved a $38 billion aid package over 10 years to Israel, which is the largest aid package in US history. And Israel is the world's largest recipient of US foreign aid. So I think, you know, as an American, whenever I speak with Americans, I constantly um, call on them to question this idea of, you know, where do your taxpayer, you know, where do your tax dollars go? And do you want your tax dollars to be funding these injustices? And I think most Americans would rather have that money stay at home and fund things like education and healthcare. I mean, this is a no brainer, this is obvious. Um, 
So, you know, this is really the, 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 I think one of the most important issues is to focus on the US role in perpetuating these injustices and in, and in funding them essentially. Um, and to try to, in some way or another, um, um, condition aid to Israel, reduce aid to Israel, end aid to Israel. I mean, these are all things that we should be discussing. And by the way, this isn't really a radical um, opinion um, because there is US law on the books, the Leahy law, for example, I don't know if you're aware of it, but it basically um, prevents and outlaws the US giving military aid to any foreign army that, that um, uh, carries out systematic abuses of, of human rights. And so there's no question that this is the Israeli army. And Noam Chomsky, Professor Noam Chomsky, has spoken about the potential use of the Leahy law um, in uh, ending or conditioning or reducing aid to Israel. Um, but nobody's talking about these things, you know, um, just the notion that we would even comply with US law. I mean, I'm not speaking about anything radical. I'm not speaking about changing legislation. I'm not speaking even about international law, which, you know, depending on who you are, you can just say, oh, well, let's ignore it. I'm speaking just about simple compliance with US law that already exists on the books. So the question of law is complicated <laughs> to resume. It really depends on political will. It depends on who's willing to make the argument that it should be enforced. A law that just exists in the books, but that doesn't have someone behind it that is pushing for its enforcement may as well not exist. Well, actually, that's what you're basically saying is that it will be on the people living in the US, France, all across Europe, where those countries have their say on international relations, that it's their responsibility to pressure their respective governments. And that's why uh, nothing, there is not a single effort we can dismiss everything is welcome to put pressure on our respective governments. And this is how democracy works. And of course, people tend to criminalize when blacks, Arabs, Muslims, Roma, and even Jews band together against you know, a specific oppression, if not most or all oppressions. But today it's about people realizing that it is not in their interest to see their governments supporting Israel in what, it, in what it's doing in occupied Palestine. Is it in the best interest of Americans to see billions of dollars sent in military aid, economic you know, stimulus packages, et cetera, when you have, I think it was like 300,000 people who died from COVID-19 in the US. Over 304,000 people died from COVID-19. 26 million people in the US don't even have health coverage. And we're talking about the you know, number one economy in the world, yet it's as if a foreign country is should be better served than the very people who compose this country or that country called America. The same thing for France. You know, is it you know, is protecting you know Israeli interests in the best interest of France? Absolutely not. But again, you know, uh, the rule of the law is always political. It depends on who's going to give teeth to the law. And these this international body of you know of laws has got no teeth because people don't pressure their governments. And their governments are pressured by specific lobbies, well-funded, yes, extremely organized, yes. But I tend to be, I'm not going to say cynical, but I often say, if they can do it, it's because they think they can do it and get away with it. The question is, how come they are doing it and nobody is stopping them? And I don't see any incentives for either APAC or the CRIF in France to stop doing what they're doing. My last question, uh, Lara, is uh, what do you tell Americans as a Palestinian woman, legal scholar who's very versed in, in, in these, on these topics, who's living the Palestinian question day in, day out, you know, through, in, in your skin, as you say in French, what do you tell Americans and what do you tell French people? And more specifically, minorities in those countries who natural, are the natural allies to the Palestinian struggle? Yeah, I think I would just highlight the importance of standing up against injustice anywhere. Because the fact of the matter is, is once an injustice is perpetuated anywhere in the world, it becomes precedent. It becomes um, something which then says to somebody else, hey, it's possible to do this and get away with it. And you know, I've been following what's been happening in France, and I've been following a lot of your work. And you know, when you said that um, police brutality in the banlieue has been the status quo for decades and decades and decades, but all of a sudden the French uh, people woke up 
during the protests of the Gilets Jaunes because it was now all of a sudden in downtown Paris. I think this is a really great illustration of this point. The idea is that, you know, we've all heard the phrase that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Um, and, and I really do believe that. So I, I encourage Americans, I encourage French people, I encourage um, Arab citizens living under non-democratic repressive regimes to, to the extent possible, um, uh, continue to, to resist and to speak out. Um, I know that it's easier in some places than others, and I don't make any, um, you, you know, I, I don't want to um, make any mistake about, about that. Some, some people do live under really repressive systems where they don't have the freedom of speech and where they can't speak out against um, politicians. Um, we've seen, for example, in Bahrain, like the anti-governmental activists that were protesting in Bahrain, many of them were arrested. Uh, there were, there are some on death row now. So, you know, these are things that do come with a cost. Um, so I encourage people to, to do it to the extent that they are able to, but to make no mistake about um, compromising your ethics as a strategy, um, because that will never be a strategy. If you have a chance if, to say something, to speak out, to participate in an action, to boycott, to, to educate your friends and family, to speak about the issue, then do it. Because um, ultimately, it's, it's our rights that are going to be at stake globally. Lara, thank you very much for this time. It was a pleasure speaking with you. And I know it has answered or addressed many questions people have on this topic. Uh, and you promised me you'll be, you will be on the French version of the podcast called uh, Les Idées Libres. I actually thought know. we were doing a French one tonight. <laughs> well, actually, I forgot myself because, you know, on, I, mean, like, I think this is, you know, this illustrates that the past, for the past three months, I've been you know, giving all these you know, interviews and all this work in English alone, because in France, there is no platform for what I do. So out of habit, I actually did it in English, but you know, we definitely have to do it in French, that the language that you master as well. I really appreciate your honesty and your sincerity in answering these questions without beating around the bush. Uh, for those who want to follow, you're available on the Instagram, on Ga at uh, Gazan Girl, same thing on Twitter. The Gazan Girl on Twitter. Uh, the Ga that's true. Actually, actually, yes, the Gazan Girl in Paris. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, the Gazan Girl. So, uh, for all of you uh, listening and watching, please remember that Palestine is today, for any person fighting for human rights and civil liberties, the symbol of the what it looks like to have militarism, racism, you know, imperialism you know, and all kind of oppressions being applied by an entity without absolute, almost no scrutiny from the, uh, the so-called international community. Of course, we may feel more concerned about what happens nearer to us, but Israel has been exporting its know-how for repression all over the world. It has, it has exported its know-how to the American police, to the French police, it participated in the torture of Algerian freedom fighters during their struggle against the French colonial uh, power. The uh, Burma, the, uh, the, the junta in power in Burma has been supported by Israel in its you know, horrendous crime against, crimes, excuse me, against the Rohingya uh, people. Uh, Israel is also supporting the fascist regime of Modi in India, which is persecuting its millions of uh, Muslims uh, there. So again, you know, if you really want to be pragmatic and realistic, you have to look at the world as it is and not through the lenses of ideology and where is the shortcut if you want to reach freedom. Thanks again for listening, Lara. I will let you go. Thank I hope you. to have you soon again on this podcast. My pleasure. Thank you very much. As for you, dear listeners, uh, thank you for spending this near hour with us speaking about uh, Palestine. I will see you on the next episode. In the meantime, in the meantime excuse me, Please stay safe, wear a mask, social distancing, and if we don't speak in the meantime, have a series of happy holidays, whatever your religion, if you have one or not. Speak to you soon. Hey there, this is Yasser Luwati, host of your podcast, The Breakdown. Thanks again for listening. If you think this podcast does deserve your support, please don't hesitate to make a donation on cjl.ong slash donation. That's charliejulietlima.oscarnovembergolf slash donation. 
whatever amount you think is fair, please do it. That would allow us to pay our bills, pay the right people, and of course, make this podcast sustainable on the long run. Stay safe and talk to you soon.